Hi, good morning everybody. We'd like to welcome everyone to this installment of the IPHC 2021 seminar series. Um, I'm going to do an introduction to the speaker and then she'll do her presentation. We'll have an opportunity for questions afterwards. We still have people logging on, so we're not going to jump immediately into it, but wanted you to know that this is a live broadcast and we are about to go here. So today it is our pleasure to have Dr. Lauren Wild presenting perspectives of depredation from fishermen, scientists, and whales. Lauren was born and raised in Sitka in Southeast Alaska and grew up around the fishing industry with many family and friends earning their living on the water. After graduating from Sitka High School, she attended Brandeis University in Boston, Massachusetts, where she graduated with a BA in International and Global Studies and a minor in Mathematics. During a study abroad semester in Madagascar, Lauren became interested in marine science and whale research, so she began volunteering for Jan Straley, a professor of biology and a whale researcher at the University of Alaska Southeast Sitka campus. In 2009, she returned to Southeast Alaska and was hired by Professor Straley as a research technician on the Southeast Alaska Sperm Whale Avoidance Project, or CSWAP, a collaborative project of fishermen, scientists, and fisheries managers working to better understand sperm whale interactions with commercial longline fishing vessels. Throughout her tenure with CSWAP, Lauren worked as an acoustic technician and obtained a master's degree in marine mammal science at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, where she studied with some of the top sperm whale acousticians in the world. CSWAP also introduced her to the world of fisheries in Alaska, and she became fascinated with the cultural and career importance of this field. She went back to school and received her PhD in fisheries from the U University of Alaska Fairbanks College of Fisheries and Oceans and Sciences, graduating this past May 2020. Lauren is currently an assistant professor with the Fisheries Technology Program at the University of Alaska Southeast Sitka campus. And in her free time, she can be found hiking, camping, fishing, playing music, or hunting with family, friends, and her husband, Evan, or dog, Misa. Questions can be submitted via the questions tab on your control panel, uh, which is likely on the right-hand side of your screen, and these will be read out at the end of the presentation for Dr. Wild to respond to. And this presentation will be recorded and available on our website uh, probably later in the day. So with that, Lauren, you're welcome to take it away. All right, thank you. I'm just gonna make sure I can control this. Um, okay, so thank you all for coming today. It's a little bit odd not to see everybody, but um, I'll be speaking to you about my work um, for the past 12 years or so studying sperm whale interactions with commercial longline fisheries in the Gulf of Alaska. Um, the work that I'll, I've been involved with has a lot of collaborators, so first I'd just like to acknowledge um, my main co-authors that have contributed to this work. Um, Jan Straley, Russ Andrews, Aaron Thode, Dan Falvey, Linda Benkin, Tori O'Connell, and Franz Muter. They all contributed substantially to the work I'll be presenting today. Um, and let's see if I can advance my slides. There we go. Um, so in addition to my co-authors, I just want to acknowledge that this work is part of a large collaborative group with many partners and key players. So we work with scientists uh, that represent many different universities and nonprofits and institutions. Uh, we work with managers from both uh, NOAA Fisheries and the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. And then we're also full partners with fishermen. Um, we primarily work with the Long Line, Alaska Longline Fishermen's Association or ALFA, um, but we've done some work with the Central Bering Sea Fishermen's Association as well. Today, I'm going to try to cover quite a bit of ground um, to give you some background on the project, and then I'm going to dive into some of the highlights of our research. Um, it's going to be a lot to go over, so I might speed through some stuff, but it'll hopefully give you a nice overview um, of, of the project and what we've been working on. And then finally, I'll finish up with some um, deterrence or avoidance measures um, to minimize depredation. Because I'm focusing on sperm whales today, I just wanted to give a quick background there. They're a cosmopolitan species, so they inhabit pretty much all of the world's major oceans. Females and calves are thought to primarily stay in low latitudes, kind of in the equatorial waters, the warmer waters, while males um, 
once they reach sexual maturity, migrate to productive high latitude, high latitude feeding grounds. Um, and so this is where they're thought to be pretty solitary, but um, we do see them kind of in, in what we call bachelor groups here in the Gulf of Alaska sometimes. Sperm whales remove fish from commercial fishing gear worldwide. Um, this removal is known as depredation. So when I talk about depredation, that's, that's what that interaction is. Um, so I just wanted to show you kind of a couple other areas in the world where a lot of this, a lot of sperm whale depredation takes place. And we um, have contacts that do research on these interactions in other parts of the world too. So in the Southern Ocean, um, sperm whales target um, longline fishing for Patagonian toothfish. So there's some work being done off South Georgia, the Crozet and Kerguelen Islands, um, and in the Australia, New Zealand area. And then in the Northern Hemisphere, um, more recently, sperm whales have started targeting halibut longline gear off Norway. And so we have a few colleagues there that we've been um, kind of keeping in touch with uh, as they start kind of the beginning of their depredation adventure. And then in the Gulf of Alaska, um, we primarily see sperm whales targeting um, our longline fishing gear here as well, demersal gear. And this, uh, this interaction primarily occurs in our region with um, sablefish. So we also call that black cod. Um, and I'm sure most of you, if you're at an IPHC webinar, are familiar with longline fishing. So I'm going to breeze through it. But um, this fishery occurs um, offshore in the Gulf of Alaska. Um, and the boats that are fishing target halibut and sablefish or black cod. It's a hook and line fishery, small boats. Um, the gear is set pretty deep, so 300 to 1,000 meters, about six, uh, sorry, 1,000 to 3,000 feet. Um, and typical longline sets for sablefish are three to six miles long, but as many of you know, um, that can be extremely variable just based on fishermen preferences. Whales target the gear usually as it's being hauled to the surface um, when the fish are kind of just dangling off the hooks um, throughout the water column like a conveyor belt of sushi for them so it's an easy meal. Um, and then this is a quick video. Um, I'm not sure if folks can hear the sound. I should have tested that earlier, but if you can, you're hearing sperm whales clicking pretty loudly. Should hear two whales and the, the video camera is pointed up at the surface it's in ambient light so it's not that deep um, and you can see two black cod or sable fish hanging from the hanging from hooks and this whale is what we call buzzing or creaking um, which is a, a prey hunting technique or an echolocation sound and you can see the whale come in um, and it, you can see the teeth on the lower jaw and it puts that through its mouth um, and the line bends up to the surface and then one of the fish pops off. You can see it float away and unfortunately then the whale extracts itself. Fishermen call this technique flossing. Um, this is this way that whales kind of maneuver around the line. Unfortunately, the um, whale and the fish go off camera for that prey ingestion. Um, so we don't get to see what it looks like at the end, but I'm um, just going to see if somebody could put in the chat maybe um, that they could hear anything, because I have a couple sounds that I'm playing in a little bit. And um, so if you could hear that video, um, it would be good to know so that I can uh, make sure that you can hear the other sounds that I'll play. So just keep me posted on that. All right, so this interaction that you just saw um, is not new. Um, it's been encountered since the foreign fishing fleets. Oh, wonderful, the sounds can be heard, excellent. Um, so this, this interaction is not new, but encounters have become more frequent. And we think that that is in part because um, of the switch in management in the mid 1990s, this fishery in, in Alaska shifted from a derby style fishery where the fishery which was open for only a few short weeks or months um, to a individual fishing quota or IFQ system. 
And what that did, among other things, was lengthen the season. So fishermen could fish between, it's open from about mid-March to mid-November. So that kind of has a much longer period of time where fishing boats are out on the fishing grounds and that allowed whales to kind of learn what was happening. Let's see. All right, so in 2003, the Southeast Alaska Sperm Whale Avoidance Project was first um, funded. And it kind of all started when some fishermen approached some local scientists, um, Jan Straley being one of them, who was my original um, mentor on this project, um, just noting that they were seeing sperm whales coming around their boats and they wanted to know more about that. Um, and then they started seeing whales taking their fish. And so they kind of instigated this project um, and now it's a really wonderful collaborative group of um, fishermen, scientists, and managers. And the main goal is to minimize these interactions. So just to kind of orient you, I'm based out of Sitka, and this is where CSWAP kind of does most of our work in the eastern Gulf of Alaska. So that's primarily the interaction I'm going to be talking about today, and that's involving sperm whales um, and sablefish. But as you move further um, west in the Gulf of Alaska to the central and western Gulf, you start seeing more killer whales that are involved in depredation. So they're doing the same thing, taking taking black cod or sablefish off boats. Um, and then when you get, by the time you get further out west to the Aleutians and Bering Sea, it's primarily killer whales engaged in depredation there. So I'll be focusing here in our study area on the eastern Gulf. So um, you'll get pretty familiar with this kind of region, if you're not already familiar with Southeast Alaska, um, we do a lot of work off of Baranoff and Chichikov Islands, kind of in that red boxed area. Um, so that is kind of our main, our main area of focus where we do most of our research. Okay, so diving into some of the research we've, we've done. Um, initially, uh, many of the fishermen that were interested in, in this interaction that were experiencing depredation wanted to know big picture questions like who are these whales, where where are they coming from, how many are there, how are they finding our boats out in this big ocean, are they male, female, what kind of population are we dealing with. So initial work on CSWAP looked at the population dynamics and um, they gave fishermen disposable cameras um, to take pictures of the flukes or tails of these whales. So sperm whales, a lot like humpback whales, have very unique fluke prints um, or their ident unique identifiers um, of their flukes, as you can see in these photos. There's about 122 whales in our catalog currently in our little study area, um, which is part of a larger group of whales in the Gulf of Alaska. And our current abundance estimate is about 153 whales in our region, um, give or take. And this is part of kind of, as you know, a larger population inhabiting the Gulf of Alaska. Um, and then when we looked at those individuals, we started looking at sighting histories and so how often we were seeing whales and we noticed that there were about 10 or 12 whales that we see a lot more frequently than others. And we call these our serial depredators or our most unwanted whales. Um, an example of one of these is um, pictured on the right, Gulf of Alaska whale 26. Um, his nickname is Jack the Stripper because he's really good at stripping long line gear, but he was seen you know, 10 in the last 14 years, always close to Sitka, um, kind of in a little bit of site fidelity there um, and kind of has a spot that he likes to hole up at. And then in terms of male or female um, genetic samples from tissue samples that we've collected have all come back as male. That isn't to say there are no females or calves in the Gulf of Alaska, but we haven't seen any, nor have we gotten any genetic um, results from females and calves. We definitely see smaller, more more juvenile males that have probably more recently um, migrated up to Alaska to feed. And then we also have some pretty big males too. So, so you do see size differences, but they seem to all be males at this point. Okay, moving right along, acoustics. Um, we've done a large amount of research for focusing on acoustics and using that um, technique to study these whales and how they interact with boats. So fishermen were really interested in how the whales were finding their boats um, and how they knew they were hauling gear rather than just transiting. And so um, many fishermen or originally thought it was the hydraulics um, on their boat or the sounder, um, but it turned out to be kind of this simple propeller cavitation pattern. And 
as fishermen haul their fish their long line up to the surface, they typically shift in and out of in and out of gear, which engages and disengages the engine so that they can stay on top of that line as it's coming up from the bottom. And doing that um, causes the propeller to spin and stop and spin and stop, which um, creates bubbles, which are very loud underwater. So what you're looking at here is a spectrogram, which is basically a visual representation of sound. On the x-axis is time. So this is about two minutes, 120 seconds of, of sound. And um, the frequency is the y-axis, which is kind of the pitch. So lower pitches at the bottom, higher pitches at the top. And then the color is just how loud it is. So at the beginning for the first 20 seconds, the engine's in neutral. This is a recording of one of our fishing boats hauling gear. Um, and you can see kind of a low frequency hum of the engine. And then when it engages the engine into gear, um, that, that uh, propeller cavitation starts and is really loud as you can see it jumps up. And what you're looking at, you can see the kind of three little blips of propeller cavitation as the engine engages and disengages. And that's a really unique pattern um, that these whales have cued into. So that's what we kind of call our dinner bell or our acoustic cue. And then while we're kind of talking about acoustics, sperm whales are acoustically active. They're, they use sound to navigate and forage. Um, they dive very deep where there's an absence of light. So that's how they see underwater is with sound. Um, there's three main types of sounds that they use in the Gulf of Alaska, and those are clicks, creaks, and clangs. So I'll just go through them really quickly. Clicks um, occur about once a second. It's the primary vocalization. Hopefully you can hear that clicking. Um, and they do this most of the time they're underwater. So if you stick a hydrophone underwater and you hear this, you know there's a sperm whale pretty nearby. And then when they hone in on prey, their clicks get faster and faster. And that turns into a buzz or what we call a creak. Um, and this is when they're kind of really honing in on a prey item. We think this is a foraging metric or it's, it's associated with prey capture attempts. This is a creak that's really loud because the whale was um, creaking at the acoustic recorder we had underwater. It was trying to figure out what it was. Oops, let's see if I can play that. All right, so hopefully you could hear that one. Um, and then the last sound is, is not as frequently heard. It's called a clang. And this is actually a sound I studied for my master's. Um, but it's produced by males throughout the world, um, thought to be a male-only signal. And it's kind of more twangy and metallic. And if you look at this spectrogram, you can see instead of those clicks really close together, the clangs happen about every five or eight seconds. Um, and they're really twangy and reverberant. And um, here, I'll play it for you. You can hear a whale clicking faintly in the background, and then you'll hear these reverberant um, clangs. There's one. So um, these occur mostly when the whales are, are ascending up to the surface, which is not when, you know, they're not feeding, they're not um, navigating during that time, that during that part of their dive. And so we think this is more of a contact call or something that kind of broadcasts their presence because it's so loud. Okay, so we use a, a variety of acoustic platforms to do this work, to study the acoustics. Um, primarily tags, acoustic recorders, and acoustic arrays. So this is just kind of a hodgepodge of a lot of them. Um, our acoustic recorders have gotten big from the, the bottom right is me holding a recorder. Um, like about 10 or 15 years ago. And, and then the bottom center, you see that's my hand holding what the new age um, recorders, which are you know much, much smaller that fit in your hand. A lot of our recorders we've made in-house. So in the top right, you can see a variety of recorders over time that we've had that were built by our engineers and sound technicians down in San Diego. Um, but we've evolved them so they clamp easily. We call them fisherman-friendly clamps. Um, in the on the on the right-hand side, there's a white recorder with a metal clamp, and it's got green tape on it. And that's kind of our more recent iteration that um, 
clamps directly to the buoy line on the fisherman's gear so they can just clamp it on and off easily and record what whales are doing around their fishing gear while they're fishing. And they can also put them um, autonomously on just an anchored buoy line, you know, a quarter or half a mile from their gear. And then we use acoustic tags. So these are suction cupped um, tags that in the top right and in the, in the top left, you can see somebody with a pole and it suction cups to the back of the whale. It's got a acoustic recorder on it. The orange part is a float. So when it pops off the whale, it floats to the surface and it's got a little antenna that we can, um, that transmits and we can track it and pick it back up to collect the data. Um, and these, these tags also have a pressure sensor so we can um, record the depth the whale's at and they have an accelerometer, three axis accelerometer, so we can look at the pitch and the roll of the animal. So we can look at how it moves while it's producing clicks or creaks. I'm just gonna show you a little bit of um, work that one of our PhD students did um, with some of our tag data back when I first started on the project. Um, this is kind of a busy plot, but if you just look at the top panel, the tag went on the whale, you're looking at the depth. Um, so this is showing kind of the dive profiles of the whale. And on the x-axis is time. Tag went on the whale in the morning, around seven o'clock in the morning. Um, and at the beginning there on the top panel, you see nice two nice deep dives the whale produced. And then the red vertical lines are the fishing halls. So the first fishing hall started a little after nine in the morning. And um, that whale just switched immediately to kind of shallower diving behavior. Um, there's some vertical dashed lines that show the end of the first fishing haul, and then the regular, um, the straight red line then shows uh, the, the start of the second haul. And so you can see that diving behavior changed. And then in the afternoon or evening when the fishermen finished hauling gear, those dives went back to kind of nice natural foraging deeper dives. Um, the second panel and third panel both show acoustics from um, the middle panel being the click rates, so how, how often the whale was clicking, and the bottom panel being the creek rates, so that's the foraging metric. Um, and you can see with both of those, during that fishing haul, the whale um, was increasing its click and creek rate, and then at the end in the evening, you can see that that decreased quite a bit. Um, so during the fishing haul in pink there, you see kind of shallow or short dives with quite a bit of acoustic activity. And then in the afterward, these regular deep dives where it's maybe not creaking and clicking as much, maybe because it was full. So some of the main findings from that work, um, there was a lot more that went into it, but this is kind of some of the main stuff that's interesting that natural foraging dives um, and depredation diving behavior is different from these whales. They click more while they're around fishing vessels. They creak more, so they're feeding more. These, this is all kind of intuitive. Um, and then their diving behavior is a bit different. We did see some deep dives while they were not, while they were depredating, um, but those click and creak rates remain um, remain higher, and the pitch and the roll, the accelerometer data um, changes as well. So. That's some of the um, tag data. Um, I'll get into some of our video camera data. So that first video you saw was from an old 2006 Sony camcorder. And the reason it didn't go down to the bottom was because we didn't have a pressure, um, a pressurized case for it that could withstand the depths of longline gear. So we started moving into using GoPros about six years ago, um, which because they're small, they we can, use a deep water housing that allows them to go down to the bottom of the ocean um, during long line fishing sets. So we could actually attach these directly to the ground line in between hooks to really try to get um, some more footage of these whales taking fish. Um, so the pieces of this puzzle were the, the deep water housings that could go down to a thousand meters. We used an external go get battery pack that we um, wired in so that they could record for longer. And then we built this circuit board where we could um, program the camera, we could um, attach an accelerometer and an acoustic uh, hydrophone so that we can run acoustics in from the outside of the, from the, outside of the device. Um, we programmed a time delayer in there and it was just this, this knob that fishermen could twist and say how many hours they wanted it to sleep at the bottom of the ocean before it woke up while their gear was soaking, because we really wanted it to just wake up right when they were about to haul their gear. 
Um, we used time delay lights so that we could see what was happening down there. Um, and we attached a hydrophone to the uh, back of it. Um, I'm not gonna show you our highlight reel right now because we don't have time, but um, I will, I do have it. We can look at it at the end during the question period. And we also have it posted on, C on our CSWAP um, YouTube channel. Um, the spoiler alert is that we didn't get any footage of sperm whales taking fish, but we got some amazing footage of the habitat, the bottom of the ocean down at a thousand meters. Um, fishermen were really interested in that and we saw some cool stuff. So that was great. Um, the cameras were pretty finicky and oftentimes the time delay didn't work and we would just get footage of the wheelhouse or something of the boat. But, um, but I'll show you a bit of the highlights at the end. Okay, moving into diet, um, fishermen wanted to know how important black cod or sablefish really were to, to whale diets. Um, did they normally eat them? How much? What other fish were they eating out there? Um, so traditionally to study diet, you can need to cut open a whale's stomach, um, which can be difficult. Or you need to collect feces, which is also difficult. Um, you end up with small sample sizes. You need a dead whale or you need a whale to poop at the surface where you can collect it. Um, so you, you don't get a very good idea of what they're eating oftentimes. Um, with these small sample sizes. So what we use um, was stable isotope analysis to look at our current diet of whales, which um, this has become a co common method used by ecologists and biologists to study the diet and trophic connections of animals and then the ecosystems in which they live. So essentially measuring and comparing the chemical composition of animal tissues can be used as a proxy for diet. It files follows that old adage, you are what you eat. So the chemical properties of your food are then integrated into your tissue. And you don't need to totally understand all of this um, for the purposes of this talk, but essentially as you move up the food chain, um, the chemicals composition of your tissue gets um, integrated from the diet, from your diet at kind of a predictable rate. So we can kind of look at relationships between prey and predators um, based on those, those pathways. So to study the historical diet of sperm whales, we didn't need stable isotopes because we had stomach contents because sperm whales were heavily whaled during commercial whaling in the, in the early to mid 1900s. And this is a sperm whale at the Accutan whaling station in the Aleutian Islands in the early 1900s. Um, I just thought this was a cool um, graphic showing shore-based whaling stations in the early to mid-1900s. The peak of commercial whaling was between 1940s and 1965 to 7. Um, and these are, these are some of the shore-based whaling stations, but there were also factory ships um, operated by the Russians and the Japanese. So to look at the historical diet of these whales, we looked at commercial whaling records. Um, from the Russians, Japanese, Canadians, and U.S. in the Gulf of Alaska. Um, fish made up a huge portion of their diet. Now this is, again, the eastern Gulf of Alaska. In other parts of the, the western Gulf and Bering Sea, they, they primarily eat squid. But in the eastern Gulf and B.C. coast, they were primarily eating fish. Those fish tended to be rockfish, ragfish, dogfish, and skates. Um, ragfish are not commonly caught or seen um, these days. It's hard to get your hands on one, but they seem to be a pretty high diet item for sperm whales back in the day. And then for squid, they mostly were eating magister squid, which are kind of a bite-sized squid, and then arm hook squid, which are pretty big, robust club hook squid. They're, um, they can be six to eight feet long. And then sablefish, didn't seem to be a big part of their diets. We didn't really find mention of them from the BC and, and Gulf of Alaska records. We identified them in some stomachs from some of the reports further down the US coast off California, um, but they didn't seem to be important in the, in the stomach contents uh, up here in our region. Then to look at the current diet, um, we used tissue samples. So we took biopsy samples, that's me with a crossbow, um, that we use to collect a tissue sample from whales. It's minimally invasive. You don't have to capture the whale um, or kill it. Here's a quick video of what that looks like. 
the yellow float there is on the tip, and then there's a metal tip that collects the sample when it bounces off the whale. So that was a nice flat calm day we had offshore um, a couple years ago. And then the arrow floats and we can pick it up. And then there's a little um, sample. You can see the blubber hanging out of the tip. You can see a couple fishing boats in the background um, and my trusty um, interns that summer. And so there's a little bit of blubber there and then there's a little bit of skin. And we use that skin for um, our stable isotope analysis. And then we collected prey too. So we could compare the chemical composition of the prey into the sperm whale tissue. So we looked at those common prey, the dogfish, rockfish, skates, and then we know they're eating sablefish because that's their depredation target. And then grenadier are also on uh, longline bycatch, so we collected some of those too because we figured whales might be eating those. We collected squid from um, various sources. We also, I just put the ragfish in there because we were able to get two of them, but they were in shallow waters outside of our region, so we weren't able to use them for our analysis. But they, they do exist, we know that. Um, and then fishermen donated quite a bit of squid. Um, I put out flyers and stuff for them and they would call me and anytime they caught a big squid on their gear while they were longlining. Um, and so I used those samples as well. Um, really quickly, my some of the results from that, um, we first looked at sperm whale samples, tissue samples that were collected kind of in the early days of sea swap, so 2003 to 2009. Um, and then we compared that to more recent samples to see if, you know, over time, as depredation has gotten worse, how their diet has changed. Um, and I just want to draw your attention to our sablefish um, and dogfish group, that proportion you can see from the older samples in yellow to the more recent samples in purple, the proportion of their diet um, that contains sablefish has definitely increased quite a bit. And then if you look to the right there, short raker rockfish and were other historical diet items, and those you can see um, have some pretty big percentages or proportions as well. Um, the other thing that we looked at was um, the seasonal aspect of, of their diet. So throughout the summer months as they're feeding on and depredating up in the Gulf of Alaska, does their diet shift at all? And you can see with our sablefish group that from early mid to late summer in the green, um, the proportion of sablefish in their diet does increase. Um, and then if you look over to the rockfish and the skates, you can see that those are also, again, pretty big diet items. Um, sablefish ended up making up about 50% of their diets overall during the summer months. So it was quite a substantial contribution. So kind of a, a summary of that work. Um, we know these are generalist predators. They're eating sablefish, dogfish, skate, squid, and rockfish. They're eating a lot of, of uh, different fish and squid. Historically, it doesn't seem like they ate much sablefish in our region, but it has increased over time. Um, and it increases throughout the summer season as well, as we might expect. Okay, so moving, moving through research to our, um, our last component of research, which is our tagging, our tagging work of these whales. So we looked at their movement. Um, generally, we wanted to look at their range, the timing of their migrations, kind of where these animals hang out, what habitat they prefer. Um, and then are they foraging or transiting? What are they doing? Can we, can we identify some foraging hotspots of these whales? We use um, satellite tag transmitters that implant into the tissue of the whale. They're designed by one of our colleagues, um, Russ Andrews, who works with wildlife computers to design these tags. Um, and they, here's a video of us, Russ deploying a tag. There it goes into the whale. And the arrow will pop off and the tag stays on. And it transmits to polar orbiting satellites and then back down to us at our, our lab station. And we can see basically in near real time when the whale's at the surface where it is. So we get we get locations transmitted. Um, these red dots in our study area are locations where we've tagged whales. Um, so there have been about 29 tags that we had that had um, usable data on them over the last 
between 2007 and 16, and then um, half of them about had dive data, so they had a pressure sensor, so we could look at the diving behavior of the whale too. So generally, where are they moving? Um, this map is showing you um, uh, some, each color is a different tag, and then all the dots are the different location estimates we got from that tag while it was on. So some of our whales, as you can see, look like they stay kind of in the same spot the entire time the tag is on. They're just hanging out, depredating and feeding. Some of them uh, move up north and northwest along the shelf edge. And then some of them traveled south and went up into Baja or down off the coast of Mexico before the tags um, fell off and stopped transmitting. So there's quite a bit of movement of these whales. We also looked at the, their speed. Um, and we found that when they were within the Gulf of Alaska, their kind of daily horizontal movement rates were pretty low. And then when they left the Gulf of Alaska, um, they sped up. And then we also looked at habitat. So those location estimates we got from the whales tended to be um, over the continental slope um, three quarters of the time. And so this is kind of that region where the continental shelf drops off deeply into the deep ocean basin. And this is our productive longline habitat. This is where fishermen are setting gear for, um, for sablefish. So it makes sense. But throughout, even when the whales left Alaska, they stayed over this continental slope habitat. Um, and then the last thing we looked at was um, uh, use some modeling to estimate using state space models to estimate the behavior of the whale and whether or not it was traveling or foraging. Um, I'm just going to kind of briefly go over this um, because I don't have time to totally get into it, but this map is showing one or two of our tags and those, those state space models indicated that Primarily, when the whales were in the Gulf of Alaska, they were mostly foraging. Um, and then when they left, um, those blue dots are the transiting behavioral states. And so they were primarily transiting. And that makes sense, right? If you think about the speed increasing, the horizontal movement rates, um, they weren't spending as much time foraging. Um, so the Gulf of Alaska certainly must represent some a, an important foraging hotspot or foraging ground for these whales. So our take homes um, here from the tagging work is that whales will move both north and south within the Gulf of Alaska. They stay on that continental slope. When they get, when they start moving south, they start speeding up um, and they change their behavior from foraging to traveling. Okay, so I have a little bit more time just to go through some of our um, deterrents that we've tested. So these are countermeasures kind of to reduce depredation. So using all the things we know about whales, these sperm whales and this interaction and what we've learned, we want to use that information to try to come up with ways to minimize the interaction. Um, we, A lot of uh, different types of ideas have been thrown around, um, some that we've tested, some that we haven't. So the first one, metal on the line, using flashers or spoons, we it seems that whales don't like echolocating off of metallic objects. So we thought, well, maybe the snap gear or fixed gear versus tube gear might be important to minimizing depredation or maybe putting flashers or spoons on the gear like, um, like salmon trollers use um, could help. There wasn't much success with that. It didn't seem like there was any significant difference in depredation rates between different gear types um, or putting things on the line. Um, we did some experiments with some beads that I don't have time to get into, but I'm gonna, um, I'll, so briefly, the, we did do some playback where we played um, sounds of transient killer whales, which are a known predator of sperm whales. We played white noise, we played frequency modulated sweeps to kind of distract them. The short take home is that whales didn't seem to react to those sounds that we played back underwater. Um, but I will go into a, a little bit more detail on an acoustic decoy we tested and some avoidance measures we tested. So those were our more recent um, depredation or deterrent testing. So starting with the um, decoy, this kind of, this was an experiment that sought to use the acoustic cue to our advantage. So we thought, well, if we can record the sound of an engine cycling and hauling gear back, then we play it to whales in an area where there isn't any fishing, they'll be attracted to that sound, they'll leave the real fishing area, they'll go to where this decoy is, 
Um, and this idea kind of came from fishermen because they they would say often that if they had whales on them, they would stop fishing, buoy off their gear, and then they would drive by another fisherman that was fishing and drop the whales off on the other fishermen. So we figured, well, what if we just create an acoustic decoy that, that does the same thing, but without creating bar fights when they get back to town? So, um, so we recorded the sounds of fishermen hauling gear, and we loaded it onto a playback device that had um, that's in the bottom right there, and then that that bottom center photo with the blue speakers are the speakers that were attached to the device and played that sound underwater. And fishermen, we gave it to fishermen to test out, and this is kind of a schematic showing how they how they tested it. So they would set their true fishing set, buoy off, and we gave them a recorder so that we could hear if whales showed up and when the whales showed up at their fishing gear. And then they went some distance away. We let them choose that distance between one and 10 nautical miles. And they set an anchored buoy line with the playback device on it um, and an acoustic recorder so that we could confirm if whales showed up at the decoy. And then they went into somewhere shallow and anchored up. And then when they came back out to haul their gear, they could remotely activate that playback device and turn it on before they got to their fishing set so that the whales would be attracted to that sound and they could go over and haul their fishing set in peace. So how did it work? Um, we had 14 successful trials where there were actually whales around and, um, and the decoy turned on successfully. There were a lot of electronic malfunctions, but um, so what this plot is showing you is on the y-axis, the number of whales that showed up at the fishing hall, and then the distance between the decoy and the fishing hall on the x-axis. So you can see on three occasions, you had no whales show up at the fishing hall, um, and they were only at the decoy. And these were at larger distances, where the decoy was set pretty far away from the fishing hall. Um, and you can kind of see a pattern in this plot, a, a negative sloped line that would go from kind of around the three down to this, um, the whales at the decoy. And what we found here was that distance was really important. The further away the decoy was, the fewer whales actually took the time to swim over to the fishing hall when it started. So they would swim, what we imagine is they would swim to the decoy because they were attracted to that sound. They would hang out there for a while, realizing probably full well that there was a speaker playing that sound and not a fishing boat but they would hang out for long enough. And if it was far enough away from the fishing hall, when they heard that fisherman start fishing 10 miles away or so, it wasn't worth their time to swim all the way over. Or by the time they did, the fisherman had gotten most of his gear in, on the boat. Um, and then obviously there were some caveats with this um, and it would need some electronic work to make it more fisherman friendly and easy to work with on a fishing boat not so heavy and stuff, but it was really promising. Um, and then the last one that I wanted to get into was the idea of avoidance and information sharing networks. So we did this experiment where um, we gave fishermen that signed up for a re reporting network an in-reach satellite texting device. And as most of you probably know, it's not um, ideal to share your fishing locations often when you're a fisherman. So we divided the region up into zones and fishermen could report, they would, they would, they would text twice a day um, what zone they were in and if they saw any whales, if they had any whales on their gear. Um, and then we would compile all those reports from all the different fishermen that, that reported that day. And we would send out text blast updates to these, to these fishermen that had their devices that were signed up for the network and let them know where whales were seen. So we'd say, you know, three whales were reported in zone two, one whale in zone six, four whales in zone seven, and then the rest of the zones weren't reporting. You know, no, we didn't get any reports. And that way fishermen could kind of make, make their own kind of informed decisions about where to go out and fish, where to set their next sets based on where they were getting reports and where they knew um, whales existed. And we also, when our whales were satellite tagged during this time, we let them know where satellite tagged whales were. So we would give them blasts and they could look online. We had our um, we had a, our website update in near real time with where those satellite tagged whales were too. So they had as much information at their disposal as they could have. Um, and this worked pretty well. 
uh, although we did find that a lot of fishermen just don't want to work cooperatively and and collaborate they want they want to kind of do their own thing they wanted to know when they wanted to know what other people reported but they didn't necessarily want to report themselves um, so that got a little bit tricky and then adding to that avoidance project we started working with an uh, acoustic toad array a hydrophone array this is an this is a device that you just tow behind the boat it's used a lot in oil and gas exploration when they have to do marine mammal um, mitigation measures where they can't do seismic surveys around mammals and stuff um, but we adapted this so that fishermen could just deploy it out the back of their boat it's coiled up in a tub there in that bottom right photo and they would run it off the end of their boat when they kind of got out to the shelf edge where they were going to try to start fishing and it plugs into a computer um, in their wheelhouse they could turn it on and tell right away if there were any whales clicking around so that way they didn't have to sit around and look for whales they didn't have to stop um, and put a hydrophone in the water they could just tow this while they were transiting and they could move up and not up and down the shelf edge um, until they didn't detect any whales to find places to fish so this is a project that is just starting to wrap up our initial trials um, it seems to work pretty well on fishing boats we, we've been doing a lot of electronic work to try to adapt it so that fishermen can just plug and play um, and if we can get more funding we can we can test it out more uh, in the next few years so that's been spearheaded by the Alaska Longline Fishermen's Association folks um, okay, so with that, I'll just kind of reiterate some of our general conclusions because that was a lot that I went over. Um, so we're we're looking at only males up here in the Gulf of Alaska, we believe. We have about 150 in our eastern Gulf region, um, but there's probably thousands kind of in the in the whole Gulf. Of those individuals in our catalog, there's a subset that are seen more frequently that we believe kind of are the big depredator problem problem whales. Um, they can cue into these fishing vessels from the engine hauling sounds or that propeller cavitation when boats are shifting in and out of gear. So that's how they know they're not just transiting or moving around. Um, and they they dive shallower while they're depredating. They feed more frequently, so they creak more often. Um, this is a population of whales that is recovering from commercial whaling. Sablefish didn't seem to be an historic diet item, but um, the Gulf of Alaska is an important foraging ground that has introduced them to depredation behavior, and that presents what we think is a new source of mortality for, for um, sablefish, which is, from a management perspective, really interesting. Um, and it appears that, that sablefish makes up about 50% of their diet um, in the summer when they're depredating. For habitat, they prefer that continental slope. Their behavior shifts when they leave the Gulf of Alaska heading south. They go from foraging to traveling and they speed up. Um, and then for deterrence, the acoustic decoy seems to be have the ability to delay whales arrival at the fishing hall or distract them. Um, and then it seems that fishermen can, to a certain extent, avoid fishing near whales if they join information sharing networks um, or if they use those hydrophone arrays that they can just tow and detect whales in real time. But it does require commitment from them, collaboration, and it also requires them to maybe not fish in the location that they really wanted to fish at if they're hearing whales. So there's a cost-benefit analysis that they have to go through and say, is, is depredation on my gear worth it to fish in an area where I know I'm gonna catch a lot of sablefish um, or not? And then Lastly, I think the main point that I've taken home from working on this project is that collaborative research is really beneficial. These fishermen let us use their fishing boats as a platform for research to access a species, these sperm whales, that would not otherwise be easy to access. Um, there have been a lot of collaborators and academic groups and institutions that have funded our work um, and that work with us. So I just want to acknowledge those folks um, we have a lot of partners in management with the uh, NOAA Fisheries, Alaska Fisheries Science Center folks, the Sablefish team um, led by Chris Lunsford, and then the Alaska Department of Fish and Games Sablefish group. We've done some work with their, um, I didn't really mention it, but this, the state has runs an inshore inside waters sablefish fishery um, through part of the year. So we've worked a lot with them. Um, 
lot of folks to thank that have helped with field work and analysis work for our project. The fleet has been instrumental um, in donating samples, letting us come out on their boats while they're fishing and distract them and set recorders and test out equipment. Um, so a big thank you to the fleet. And then the CSWAP PIs, obviously I'm just one person um, uh, in a group of people that started this project long before I joined it. So they really, um, they're really the, the primary folks from this project. Um, and then some of our other main contributors that have worked on the project heavily um, over time that aren't um, officially associated, but definitely do a lot of work with us. And with that, um, I will take any questions um, and I can show the video if that's something that we have time to do of our kind of our, hi our underwater highlights. Okay, uh, thank you, Lauren. Uh, there's three questions, um, okay. but if anyone else has questions, they can continue to send them in and I will see them and read them aloud. Uh, the first question is from Don Lane. He says, halibut is not often mentioned in the presentation. I hear ample reports of halibut by whales in the Gulf of Alaska. Has that been studied? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I actually don't hear many reports of halibut in our region. Um, I maybe it, maybe our fishermen haven't been mentioning it recently, but from the folks that I've asked and talked to, at least in the Eastern Gulf, um, they tell me that halibut depredation doesn't seem to be as big of an issue as sablefish depredation. Now it it has occurred. Um, I know that it's occurred because I've been on a longline boat when when um, we were doing a combo set and some a couple halibut came up munched on but um we it doesn't seem to be a big issue for our fishermen in the eastern gulf um so to my knowledge there's not a lot of research done on that i know it occurs in other places i just haven't heard official reports or anybody studying it um significantly but i'd be really interested um in where, where you're hearing about it um, and, and how it compares to sablefish depredation by sperm whales, if it's as much or if it's less. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is from Dr. Josep Planis. He says, thank you for your interesting talk, Lauren. Do sperm whales feed on long lines in groups or individually? Do oh, they have- do they have specific calls to signal feeding activity? Yeah, um, so the first part of the question are, do they feed in, in groups or individually? That's an interesting question. So they seem to approach boats individually, um, but then when you're on a fishing boat and you're experiencing depredation, there's often three or four whales around, four to six whales around. I think we've seen up to eight um, around a boat. I know fishermen have told us they've seen more, but so it appears like it's a group, but because they're all kind of close in there within a couple, within a mile of the boat um, or four or 500 meters of the boat depredating, but they don't seem to travel in groups in this area. We do see some associations of whales, like we've tagged whales before where two of them after, you know, they're all, we, we'll tag them when they're around fishing boats because they're easy to get to. But then once the fishing haul ends, they seem to kind of go off in their own directions or they'll loiter in the area and feed naturally for a while. Um, but they don't, every now and then we'll see a couple associate with each other where we'll look at these tag tracks and there'll be two whales that are tagged that kind of parallel each other um, traveling around. And, and we see that often too, when we look at our sighting history of whales, we'll look at which individuals we see around the same boats or around boats uh, together and we have noticed some patterns between individuals that that pop up when they're depredating um, kind of like oh when this guy's depredating it seems like this other one is around quite a bit so it it's not a, a yes or a no it they they definitely associate with each other they hear each other they probably don't travel in groups or packs like a pod of killer whales like is kind of what people traditionally think of as whales traveling together um, and then the other part, of, what was the other part of the question? The second part was, do they have specific calls to signal feeding activity? 
oh, well, that creak sound, that, that buzz is indicative of prey capture or prey capture attempts. So they can hear each other from miles away doing that. And if they hear a, a whale buzzing quite a bit, they might come over and eavesdrop and, and uh, hear, okay, well, that might be a good place to go check out the food because that whale seems to be feeding a lot. So that buzz is kind of the, that creak is the, the feeding capture sound. Okay, great. Um, the next question is about entanglement. And um, Richard Yamada and Peter Frey, uh, their questions kind of overlap. So um, I will try to get both their ideas in one. But right. are there issues with sperm whale entanglement in buoy lines, or are they savvy enough to avoid that, unlike West Coast humpbacks? Yeah. Sperm whales are very different than, than humpbacks um, in a, a myriad of ways. They seem to be extremely adept at maneuvering around fishing gear. I haven't heard of any whales getting entangled or seen it. Um, I've certainly seen line markings on their bodies, but we assume a lot of that has to do with them nosing into the line and letting it run across their body as they're feeding on the gear. Um, so we haven't seen entanglements. Now, in the Gulf of Alaska, the, the NIMFS, the NOAA Fisheries Management um, changed a bit with the observer program in, a few years ago where they started having observers um, on some of these smaller boats in the, in the Eastern Gulf. And observers have noted, I don't know if they've noted entanglements, but they've noted line marks on whales that they think are indicative of entanglements. Um, I'm not sure how much of it is an entanglement versus what, like I said earlier, and you saw in the video, that whale running its running a line through its teeth. Often you'll see it on their nose, on their forehead, where they're nosing into the line. Um, fishermen have told us that they'll feel they'll they'll every now and then on long line gear when the whales are kind of tugging on the line and feeding, they'll feel them. You can feel it at the top when you're at the roller as the gear's coming over pulling on that line, they can feel that tension. Um, they feel, they've felt whales, they've said, break their line, um, tug on it till it snapped, but they've never seen an entanglement um, that I know of. But that isn't to say it hasn't happened, I guess. Okay, great. And the final question is from Shane Peterson and he asks, is there any consideration of an acoustic deterrent policy by ADF and G, NIMFS, or others? Not that I know of. Um, yeah, I think we need to do more, we need to get more funding to do more trials, field trials of, of like an acoustic decoy. Um, there is a device called an Orca Saver that, that our group isn't involved with, but it's produced by a, an organ, a company called Moostad. And it, um, it's called an Orca Saver. I think it was developed for killer whale depredation. And some fishermen, I was on a, I was on a longliner out in the Bering Sea one year, um, and we had killer whales around the boat. And the boat that I was on had an Orca Saver. And it's basically, they use a, they use the boom or the crane to lower it in the water and it does the, it plays back sounds underwater and it's kind of like um a more high-pitched sounds and so that device um it wasn't a, a nymphs mandated or recommended device but it was definitely a device that was being used i think more frequently in that region to try to minimize killer whale depredation Somebody did a study about it recently that I could try to dig up that mentions or that looks at that device and it basically decided, I don't think it was in, in Alaska, it was somewhere else that the Orca Saver was used, but um, they they kind of found that the whales basically became habituated and stopped caring about the device um, because the reward was, was greater than the annoyance of the sound. Um, but yeah, there's nothing that NIMPS has has talked about uh, using, they just came out with guidelines for, for these types of deterrent devices for all fisheries. Um, the public comment period, I think was last year and they, or this past fall, 
um, and they came up with a list of suggested ways to minimize interactions. And this was for all marine mammals and all fisheries. Um, so like it includes seals and sea lions around salmon hatcheries and stuff. Um, and I don't remember if the orca saver was on there, but they they had um, recommendations for what types of devices could be used, what how loud the sound that you could produce underwater could be. So it left the left the door open for more innovation, um, but it had constraints on how loud you could produce sounds underwater for what amount of time. Um, and that was from a marine mammal perspective, trying to minimize. Um, hearing impact, uh, auditory impacts to whales um, of different species. So so that's kind of, and I'd be happy to to dig that up. I don't, the, the public comment period, I think I helped enter some comments for Alpha in the fall. So they might not have actually printed out the final rule for that, but it's in the works. Okay, and we had one comment come in. It's not a question, but a comment. So I will read that aloud. It's from Douglas Draper, and it says, I've seen a larger group of sperm whales, around 12, depredating a sablefish longline over the course of days. The main group hung back behind the vessel while one whale would swim up to the longline to take fish. The whale would then move to the opposite side of the boat and head back towards the group while another would head up to the line to take their turn. Rinse and repeat. Interesting. I wonder if they were different sizes. Um, yeah, I've seen, I haven't seen anything exactly like that, but I have seen a, whales hang out behind the boat and then some kind of coming up off the side, but I've never seen them trade off like that. Like when I've seen that, it's been a couple whales that just basically stay behind the boat the whole day. And we feel like they're feeding off spin off and, and stuff that spins and drops off the line right at the surface there and they can catch it as it goes by. Um, whereas the whales that are up off the roller will come, will, you know, will be depredating right off the hooks. But yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, where was that? Um, he didn't indicate, but okay. I can provide you with maybe their contact information and you guys yeah. could continue this conversation. Oh, he replied and said it's um, Central Gulf. Okay, yeah. It, it What I've kind of, it seems like when you, the more you study sperm whales, you realize they change, and the minute you think you have them figured out, they're, they do something different. And what's really struck me in the last few years is that it seems like there's a lot of behavioral differences in depredation between the eastern gulf and central and western gulf for sperm whales. It seems like they they seem to be a lot more aggressive and and in these more bigger groups in Central Gulf, I've heard recently from like a lot of our fishermen fish out west too. And so they'll be fishing out of Seward for a while or or Homer, and then they'll come back um, and fish in Southeast and they'll say it's like a lot different. So that's something I'm interested in, in pursuing, I guess, comparing um, these whales and are they the same individuals going up there and coming back down here, or is it kind of a different group of whales and have they kind of developed different techniques of depredation? So it's really interesting. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Lauren, for your talk. Um, we don't wanna run too far past our designated time slot here, but um, if people have questions and wanna send them into the secretariat, We'll be sure to uh, forward questions and feedback um, on to Dr. Wild. And please uh, keep an eye out for announcements for our um, future installments of this seminar series. Currently, our next one is not until April 21st, and that one is with Dr. Mark Lamelli of the Pacific States Marine Fish Commission. And he'll be, look, he'll be discussing some of his work uh, investigating bycatch avoidance and species selection studies. And outside of that, while we're looking at some of these greatest hits, I did have one question for you, Lauren, and that was on the graph where you showed um, the, the, the kind of acoustic behavior near the surface when the gear was being hauled. And then when they were doing natural dives that were deep, there seemed to be very little acoustic behavior. Did the, did the tag on the, where was the acoustic signal coming from? Was it coming from the recorder on the fishing gear or was the tag on the whale actually recording that? And are they actually 
silent while they're uh, feeding on squid, for instance? Yeah, the recorder was on the tag, so it's built into the tag, and so you can, you know, sometimes you can hear other whales around that get close on the tag, but you can definitely tell which which acoustic signal is coming from that whale, that tagged whale. Um, and they, what was the other part of your question? Did, did it change? Yeah, I was just curious if they are not actively using creeks and clicks to hunt squid, for instance, when they're doing their kind of more natural dive behavior. Are they not eating? Are they just cruising around, or do they do that activity silently? They they do creek when they're feeding on squid, because um, there's there's research in other parts of the world where they primarily eat squid that that where they've they've um, put these tags on and and shown quite a bit of creaking. Um, so in that particular tag it it looked like the whale just got full and that and that happened quite a bit in our tag data where there wasn't a lot of creaking after the haul and and i think we did like some back of the envelope calculations where we looked at um caloric intake and about how much these whales would need to eat per day based on natural foraging creek rates and then when they're depredating this is really rough estimates, but it seemed like they could eat the same amount in a twelve in a what was a three hour fishing haul um, as they can eat in like a twelve hour day. So if you think about that, then they you know if they're if they're feeding if they're depurating two hauls a day, um, they're getting what they need for that twenty four hour period roughly. Um, so in my mind, it kind of begs the question: Well, yeah, they probably don't need to eat as much when they're not depredating so that leaves them a lot of downtime during which whales could either be doing other stuff um, it could change their kind of their behavioral states or they could just continue to forage naturally not as aggressively and just get even fatter and even bigger and grow more rapidly so we don't really know what what that means but it definitely seems like they can get more while depredating than they need you know for a full day Super. Thank you very much. And thank you for the audience for your time as well. Yeah, thank you. And, and, and feel free to contact me if anybody has additional questions or wants to talk. Um, love to do that as well. Sounds good. Thank you for your time, everybody.